Um, have you ever heard one of the bumps in the night? You know what I'm saying? Like, you ever get scared? How many of you husbands in the house? Like, you're like, I think I heard something. Go to check, right? You know? And it's like, all right. Uh, and so the other night, we were laying in bed. We were watching a TV show, my wife and I. And Katie elbows, what was that? And I'm like, I didn't hear anything. And I, that's my go-to move. I just try to, you know, play it off. Because I'm like, I just want to go back. And she's doing, what, what was that? What was that? And I was like, I didn't hear anything. You're hearing things again, dear, I'm sure. It, it's just the, I, I think somebody's trying to get in the door. And I'm like, I didn't believe her. I didn't believe her at all. But, but I thought I wanted to uh, honor my wife even while I was making fun of her. And so I, I stand up out of the bed and, and I, I pull up my go-to uh, pocket knife and I'm going to walk the house, right? And she's like, you're not really going to do that. I'm like, what do you, what do you want me to do? Like, you want me to go defenseless? Like, I'm going to put a little, uh, a little chop suey on them if I find them, right? And so I'm walking through the house, checking the doors, doing this stuff. And then I hear this noise upstairs, like this huge, like, and I'm like, what is, and I'm thinking, all right, maybe she's legit. Like in this time, like this is, a, this is like the one time that it's real. And I start to walk upstairs. I'm like, who's there? Who's there? You know, or whatever. And it was my kid. My kid was in the playroom making a card for our 16th wedding anniversary. And uh, so I, I, I walked up to her with a knife. And, uh, and so <laughs> anyway, she, uh, I think uh, I went from being nervous to her being nervous. No, uh, I found out it was her really quickly before I came up the stairs and uh, her plan was ruined. She was trying to surprise us the next morning with a card, and uh, I totally ruined her plan. That's what dads do. We just ruin plans. But, but here's the thing. Uh, I, I think uh, there are real things in our world that should inspire some fear, right? It would be abnormal for us not to have fear. Fear, fear is an emotional response. And, and I, I think in our culture, we use the terms fear and worry and anxiety interchangeably, but they're very different things. And so if you want to think about sort of a medical definition of fear and a medical definition of anxiety, fear is this. It's an emotional response to an immediate threat, an immediate threat. And so, so fear is there's something in your face, there's something in your life that causes an emotional response. It's the fight or flight. Your adrenaline goes up and, and it's like you're walking in the dark alley and, and, and there's somebody present. There's somebody right there in front of you, right? This is fear. You're walking down that, somebody pops open in front of you, and you see that they're talking to you, and they say, yeah, this is a stick-up. Like, that, you should be a little bit afraid in that moment. Fear is this normal response to an immediate threat. But anxiety is different. Anxiety is the same emotional response to, to an imprecise threat, to something that's not necessarily clear, it's not necessarily present. It may or may not happen. It may be something in the future. It may be something that could happen, but, but it's not. it causes the same fight or flight response. But you sit in that state when there's nothing truly threatening in the moment. It just could be threatening. So, so that might be something like this. The difference between fear and anxiety, you walk down the dark alley, somebody pops out, and they're, here, this is a stick-up. Like, that's fear, right? You walk down a dark alley, and nobody pops out, but you still feel those same feelings of adrenaline rush. Like, somebody could pop out. I don't know. What's going to happen? I better get my pocket knife, right? Like, this is your, like, that's anxiety, okay? And so as we're talking about fear and anxiety today, I want you to know the difference. Both are these emotional responses. Fear is an emotional response to an immediate threat. Anxiety is an emotional response to a threat that's imprecise. It, it's not exactly known. It's not exactly present. It's not exactly there. But you get the same fight or flight sort of mentality, and you're stuck in this state of, of well, I need to do something, but you don't even have something to do it against yet. Right? And so that's fear and anxiety. And I think Satan tells us lies about both. Satan tells us lies about both. And so today I want us to look at one passage about fear and one passage about anxiety, and we can see God's truth about this. And so if you, if you got your notes, you may just want to jot this down about the lie that the enemy tells us about fear and, and, and then God's truth about it. And so here, here's what the enemy tells us about fear. You, you are alone, so you should be afraid. You're alone. It, the situation that you're facing is scary. The situation you're facing is impossible. The situation that you're facing is too much for you, and, and, and you're by yourself, and so you should be afraid. 
But, but here's the amazing truth from God's word. Here, here's what the Lord says to you. He says, no matter what you walk through, no matter what you go through, I'm with you and I'm in you. And so no matter what you're facing, even if it truly is scary, it's not, it's not a pie in the sky, Scientology, well, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's legit things to be afraid of. It's not just like, oh, well, you know what? This thing is happening in my life. You don't just ignore it. You don't just say, oh, well, you know, I didn't just get fired from my job. Oh, well, uh, we're not going to not be able to pay the bills. Like, I, I'm just going to keep on writing them checks and believe the money's going to be there. Like, no, no, no. It, it's not like an absence of reality. God looks at things and he says, absolutely, there's things that you should be afraid of if I were not part of the equation. But the reality is I'm with you and I'm in you. So even when you face scary things, fear is a choice. And so I want you to see what he says to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. Here, here's what the Lord says. Now, uh, can you imagine Joshua's position? Moses has been a leader of God's people for 50 plus years. And uh, he was the leader of God's people. They constantly rebelled against God and against Moses. They were constantly complaining, we don't like the food. We don't like the drink. Like, they're always like, you led us here. We were better off as slaves in Egypt. Like all the time, he couldn't do anything right. He's leading these people. And Moses goes into the tent of meeting. He meets with God. And so as Moses goes into the tent, God's presence comes and hovers over the tent of meeting. God speaks to, to Moses like he does to a friend. And Moses comes out radioactive, like he's glowing with the glory of God. And he says, hey, I was just talking with God. This is what he says to every one of you, two million people. And they still look at him and like, eh, we don't want to do that. Right? Like when he's been faced, to, he's radioactive with God's glory and they still don't want to follow him. And so can you imagine the fear that Joshua must have had to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step into those shoes. I'm going to lead those two million people. Look what he says, Joshua chapter 1. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land I'm giving you. They should have had the land 40 years before, but the people complained and they doubted and they didn't think God was big enough and they were too scared. And so 10 out of the 12 spies end up saying, there's no way we can take it. These people are giants. There's no way we can do it. It won't happen. And so because of that, God caused them to wander around for 40 years in the desert uh, as they're suffering. And so after 40 years, um, anybody ever tried to move someone out of tradition? Uh, and that doesn't go well, does it? We've been doing it like this for 40 years. It's like, well, yeah, you have. How's that working for you? And, and, but, but they have been in the desert like they've eaten the same meal every morning. They've eaten the same meal every night. You want to talk about creatures of habit? And, and, and they didn't think that they could take the land before. But now God's saying, now you lead them, Joshua. You've never led them before. Moses has always led them. It, Moses was able to do miracles. He could throw down his staff and it turned into a snake. He could put his hand into his cloak and it would turn leprous. He'd pull it out. He could put it back in and it would turn back whole. Joshua can't do any miracles. Joshua can't do these things. It's like they didn't believe Moses. But now I'm telling you, after 40 years of wandering, they weren't training in the desert for war. They're just like wandering in survival mode every single day just enough food to get them to the next day. And he says, you go take them into the land and lead them. This is your first thing as a brand new leader. Doesn't that sound like a great first task? Right? He must have been scared. Look at what he says. Verse 3, every place that your foot will tread upon, I will give to you just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, the going down of the sun shall be your territory. That's a huge amount of land to take, a huge amount of land to manage, and a huge amount of land to protect from people who aren't fighters, who've been living on rations every day for 40 years. That's a huge deal. Would you be afraid? Look at what he says, verse 5. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Look, look at this. This is the reason not to be afraid. Look, look, look at me. It wasn't the size of the army. It wasn't their experience level. It wasn't his true test of leadership. It wasn't that the people believed in him. It wasn't that they were going to follow him because before Moses dies, Joshua goes into the tent of meeting in Deuteronomy. It describes it. He says, hey, by the way, I just want you to know all these people are going to turn their backs on you and on me. And, and they're going to be punished in the brand new land. But just so you know, I'm going to be with you though. 
Like he knows this is what's going to happen. He knows this is what is his task. And in the middle of this, it's not about his confidence. He hasn't taken John Maxwell's leadership course. Like he's not gone through and found out 15 ways to be a better leader. Like he's not taking the seminar. He's not listened to any of Tony Robbins courses. He's not done any of these things, right? Like it's not in the power of his army. It's not in the, the greatness of his situation. It, it's none of those things. This is the one reason God looks at him and he says, you know, all this stuff is scary but you don't have to fear and it's right here look what it says verse five just as i was with moses read this out loud what does it say so i will be with you i will not what leave you or so be strong and courageous for you're going to cause these people to inherit the land that I swore to your fathers to give. He says, the only reason that you don't have to fear in the face of something scary is because I'm with you. Do, do you remember what I'm capable of? It's not about what you're capable of. Like, you think I'm limited to what you can do? It's not about the size of your army. You think I'm limited to the abilities of your army? It's not about your provision. You think I'm limited to just what you can provide for yourself? It, it's not about what's scary. It, it's about that I'm with you. And if I'm with you, even though you face scary things, you don't have to fear. And look at what he says. Verse 7. Only be strong and courageous. I guess he didn't get it the first time. That should be encouragement for those of us who battle fear, right? It's like the Lord's like, hey, I already told you once. What's your deal? Get with it. Right? Is that what happens? Only be strong and courageous. Be careful to do all the law that Moses commanded my servant to do. Don't turn from it right or left that you may have good success wherever you go. Is that possible? Can you keep the law? Can you keep everything that the Lord says in the Old Testament? No way. No way, right? And here's what he says. This book of the law shall not depart from where? Your mouth. But, and you shall meditate on it when? Day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that's written in it. For then you'll make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. Have I not commanded you? He's still afraid. Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened and don't be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He, he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, instead of letting the thoughts of fear like, oh, our army's not trained. Oh, we have no provisions. Oh, we're fighting against people that they said were giants. I bet they're still giants. Uh, we've got these people who have cities and walls and all these obstacles. I bet the obstacles are even more now than they were before. Instead of letting those things fill your brain, you know what you let fill your brain? The promises of God. You think about those things. Instead of giving voice to your fears, like this is what so many of us do. You know what? I'm so scared about this. We just lost a job. I'm so scared about this. My kids are headed down the wrong path. I'm so scared about this. I got the diagnosis from the doctor. He says, don't give voice to your fears. He says, you let this come out of your mouth. The things God says about your life. What he says in his word, you let that play like a tape over and over in your mind. You don't sit there and say, hey, you know what? Like, this is how bad it is. This is what's going to happen. This is my scenario. This is the situation. Girl, have you known about my marriage? Like, this is what's happening. Like, nobody has it as bad as I do. And in the middle of that moment, even when things are scary, he says, you don't give voice to your fears like that. You give voice to the scripture. And what the scripture says and that God is with you. And you only let those things escape your mouth. He says, then your way will be successful. Because you're not buying into the lies of the enemy. The enemy whispers. He says, look at all you have to face. You should be terrified. Look at what's in your bank account. You should be so scared. Look at what your kids are doing. Listen, it's too late. You're never going to teach them respect now. They're already going to be grown and gone. And they're going to screw up their life. And it's going to be over. L look at what's happening with this, with your job. You're going to be next. You're going to be downsized. Look at what's going to happen. You're going to lose your house. You're going to do it. And you have these fearful things that are truly facing you. And he says, don't give voice to those. Give voice to what the scripture says. Think about that over and over. Let that be the only tape that you play in your mind. For those of you who are uh, under 40, a tape is something that you used to play. <laughs> so they were amazing. Like uh, pull the strip out and then get a pencil and wind it back up. You know what I'm saying? Like it was, all right, it's another day. It's another sermon. But, but he says, be strong and courageous because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. No matter what you go through, God is with with you and if you're a believer he's in you do, do you know look at me right here i just i just want to say this do you know that you have it every bit more reason to stand strong in the face of fear than joshua ever did like joshua saw god do miracles 
right? He parted the Jordan and they walked on dry ground. They walked around the walls and then boom, they fell down. Like they took entire countries and he saw God work. But did you know you have more reason to trust God than Joshua did? Because see, Joshua only ever had God with him. He was never in him. But if you're a new covenant believer, if you've received the Lord Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says, Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He's not just going to be with you, beside you. He's in you. So how much more should we be confident that no matter what we walk through, no matter what scary things we actually face, it's not, oh, things are wonderful. You know, it's not like, let's be uh, 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 like not a negative Nancy and a, a happy Harry or whatever. Like, it's not that we just ignore everything that's going on. It's like life is miserable. Life is terrible. Life is hard. And I am scared. But in the face of something that's scary, I'm choosing to stand strong because God is with me and he's in me. So what do I have to be afraid of? I know what God can do. I know what he has done. I know what he's able of. So in the face of fear, I can choose courage because he's with me and he's in me. So many of us have made an agreement with the enemy. You got to face this alone. You got to figure this out. It's your marriage issue. You got to figure it out. It's your stuff. You better figure it out. You better read 18 more parenting blogs. You better make sure that you figure out and read 30 more books about your marriage. You better figure this. It's up to you. You better get your finances worked out. It's up to you. Nobody's going to do it but you. You're all alone. And so many of us have made that agreement with the enemy. And do you know what that is? That's a stronghold in your life. It's this open door for the enemy to come and just thump you over the head every time and say, you should be so scared. And God says, I'm in you and I'm with you. Are you serious? You can face anything scary and choose courage. This is fear. Let's fast forward. I see I'm losing some of you. Let's fast forward to anxiety. You ready? Anxiety. So fear is the immediate threat. Anxiety is an imprecise threat. And I would say that there's more anxiety in our house than there is fear. Like people confuse it and they say, oh, I'm worried about it. But the Bible doesn't have a distinction for worry and anxiety. It's the same word. It's the same word. And I just want to say, like, uh, for any millennials in the house, any millennials in the house? Yeah, you don't know if you're a millennial. Some of you are. That's all right. It's fine. It's, it's okay. Uh, so it, how many of you have grown up with the internet? The internet's been a part of your life. Like, you never know the joy of dial-up. Like, I'm just saying, you never knew the, the joy of going to the library and looking in the Dewey Decimal System because you had a question, and you had to pull out the stacks of cards, and you open it up, and it's like, D, 485. And then you go and you find a book, and it's like Encyclopedia Britannica from 1924, and you open it up, and it's like, tells you the stuff, like you missed out on that. But, but here's the amazing thing. More than anything in our culture, I think that people that are 40 and under, I see this huge, there's a huge battle with anxiety. And do you know why? You've grown up your whole life and you've seen everything. Do you know what? When I was growing up, if I wanted to be scared about what was going on in the world, you know what I had to do? I had to watch five minutes of a 30-minute news broadcast on one channel, right? And, and, and I wanted to play basketball, so I, I didn't do that, right? And so, so after dinner on the nightly news with Peter Jennings or Tom Brokaw or whatever it was, they would have five minutes of their 30-minute national news would be devoted to international affairs. And so of that, you may hear two or three stories about what's going on in the world. And do you know what my kids and your kids and people that are growing up in the millennial generation, see, they've seen it all from the time they were five. They see every hunger. They see every famine. They see every disease. They see every earthquake. They see every single one of the world's problems. They don't even just see the world's problems. They see each one of their friends' problems. Like before it was just a few people that you knew what was going on in their life. Now everybody knows everything in everybody's life because of Facebook. And so you're constantly bombarded with these feelings of things are terrible, things are hard, things are rough, things are all this. And then inside of us, even though it's not an immediate threat to you, even though it doesn't have anything to do with your life, we take these things on us and we say, there's not a precise threat, but I, I, I start to feel the same response and we build up this anxiety. And I want to tell you, like I, I read some of the mommy blogs all over, like I do, because you know what I'm saying, like I'm a dad, so I want to know what moms are thinking. And, and I want to tell you, like I read some of these things and there is such a spirit of anxiety in so many of the posts. I want to tell you, I've never thought about half of these things. 
And, and, and there's this deal of control. If I can just get this right and my kid eats this and does this at the right time and I protect and shield and bubble wrap and do all these things, then my kid will turn out great. But if I don't do that, am I going to screw up my kid? And there's this anxiety. It's not an immediate threat. It's not a real thing that's facing you. But in the middle of that moment, there's fear and anxiety. And so, so what does Jesus say about that? Here's the devil's lie. Here's the devil's lie. Write this down or take a picture of it. Here's the devil's lie about anxiety. Uh, it, 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 it's more subtle. And it's a question. Here's what the enemy whispers into your ear. You ready? Write this down. D does God know? Does he know about this? D does God see what's going on in your life? It, is God able? Like, can he help you here? Can he fix this? Does he, does he even care? I mean, maybe God knows. Maybe God sees. Maybe he's totally able. But he doesn't care enough about you to really step in and help you with this, does he? And so we start to have this emotional response of anxiety in the middle of this and this is the lie of the enemy and here's God's truth write this down here's God's truth and you can share it with yourself over and over I want to tell you like I, I say this over and over you can tell this to your kids as they deal with anxiety your grandkids here's God's truth you have a loving father who will read it with me always rescue or redeem it's not a, it, it's not like he's uh, got a third option he's either always going to rescue or if he lets you walk through the storm he will always redeem it always the, the bible says that there is nothing in this life that can separate us from his love the bible says he causes all things to work together for good not that all things are good but he causes even the things that are evil that other people do against us he's that powerful he's that sovereign he's that wonderful that he can take even the screw-ups that we have even the horrible things and he can take those and harness them and wrap them in his layer and flip them around and use them for our good and his glory he causes all things to work together for good for those who love him for the call according to his purpose and so look at this passage from matthew chapter 6 people were starting to be anxious Except they had a lot more reason to be than we do. Anybody got more than one set of clothes in the house? Anybody got a pantry or a refrigerator? These people didn't. And Jesus is talking to them. Look at what he says about anxiety. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. Here's what he says. Nobody can serve two masters. Either you'll love the one and hate the other or love the one and be devoted to despise the other. You can't serve both God and what? Money. You can't, you can't have two gods. You can't have two gods. And so look at what he says. Therefore, I tell you, don't be what? Anxious. About what? what? What in the world do we have to be anxious about? Don't be anxious about your life. What you're going to eat or, or what you're going to drink. Don't be anxious about your body or what you're going to put on. Does that cover almost every category? Don't be anxious about your life. Like anything going on in your life. Don't be anxious about that. Really? Jesus gives us a command. Would he give you a command if it wasn't possible? Like, would he set you up for failure in life? Be like, don't do these things, but you know what? You're going to do them. Would he give you that? No, of course he would. He said, don't be anxious about your life. What are you going to eat or drink? Don't be anxious about your body. Anybody ever get on WebMD and think, you know, you're dying of a brain tumor? Like in the middle of the, it's like, I've had a headache for a day and a half. What are my symptoms? Ebola. That's got to be it. It's got to be Ebola, right? He says, don't be anxious about your body. He says, don't be anxious about what you're going to wear. Look, look at what he says. Here's the reason why. Here's the re Is life not more than food? And, and your body more than clothes? Isn't there more to life than what you eat or drink or wear? Look at what he says. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? He says they've got no retirement plan. They've got no 401k. They're living daily bread. It's like they don't get and store up worms. They're not like the ant. They're not like the squirrel. Like they don't pack away nuts for winter. Like the birds go out and they find a worm and they eat it right then. And, and he says, if your heavenly father looks at birds, I, I hit one on the way to church today. I'm just saying, like it was just, I was, I was driving and he just kamikaze me right into my window. And I was just like, sorry, bird. But here's the thing. He says, if your father knows about those little pesky birds who get feathers on your windshield, so inconsiderate. Like if... <laughs> If he knows about those and he provides daily bread for the birds, aren't you more valuable than that to God? Did Jesus die for the birds? No, he died for you. 
Look what he says. He keeps going. Which of you, uh, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Anybody ever been anxious and it worked out great for you? Man, my life feels so much better because I was anxious all day. Yes, my body feels great. My blood pressure was amazing. I was anxious for seven weeks and my cholesterol came down 30 points. Like, have you ever heard anybody say that? It doesn't do any good, but yet we still do it. He says, is it helpful? Like, not only does God value you more, it doesn't do any good, so don't do it. Look at what he says. He keeps going. He says, and why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't either toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But read this. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into an oven, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? He says, if God spins all of this beauty into something that's going to die in a moment, then how much more will he put beauty in your life? Because see, when you stop breathing, you keep going. Like you're not here today and gone tomorrow. You have a soul. You have a spirit. And when you take your last breath here, you're eternal. You're going to spend it in heaven with Jesus or you're going to spend it separated from Jesus in a very real place called hell. And he says, if God looks at the grass of the field, that's only going to be for a season. How much more would he care for you if you stop breathing? You're still going forever, times forever, times forever, times forever. So why are you anxious? Look what he says, verse 31. Therefore, don't be anxious saying, well, what should we eat or what do we drink? Or what do we wear? Read this verse with me. What does it say? Verse 32. For the Gentiles seek after these things. Yeah, the Gentiles, he's like, um, here, here's what he says. Look right here. Don't miss this. When you give in to anxiety, you're acting like people who don't know there's a God. You're acting like it's up to me. Does God know? I guess not. Does God see? I guess not. Is God able? I guess not. I better do it. I, I don't know. I better come up with a plan. I'm in a brainstorm session. Pros and cons and pros and cons. Like, uh, is, is God able? Well, maybe he's able, but he just doesn't care. I, I'm acting like God isn't real. Like the Gentiles who think, you know, there's no God there at all. Look, look at what he says. Your heavenly father, what? He knows that you need them. You need them all. He knows your needs. You, you don't just have a God who's with you and who's in you. You have a father. You have a father who knows what you need. And he's always going to rescue you. Or if he doesn't rescue, he's going to redeem what happens to you. So what do you have to be nervous about? If the worst happens, fantastic. Because he's going to rescue you out of it or he's going to redeem it. So either way, you win. Listen, I want to tell you, for some of you, you, the things that you're anxious about, the best thing that could ever happen to you is for them to happen. Because you would see it's not that bad. Like for your kid to get sick or for you to get cancer or for you to walk through losing a job and see that God is the healer and God is the sustainer and God is your provider and that your life's peace is not wrapped up in your circumstances being great. It's wrapped up in a father who supersedes all your circumstances and he loves you and he knows you and he does see and he is able to rescue. But even if he doesn't, he'll redeem it and he'll work it out. That would be the best thing that could happen for some of us. It would teach us never to be anxious again. Look at what he says, verse 33, and I'm going to wrap up. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and some of these things will be added to you. Is that what it says? All of these things will be added to you. Therefore, look what he says, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. I love that. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. He's like, ain't nobody got time for that, right? Look, look, look at me right here. They're, they're called daily mercies for a reason. It, it's because it's enough mercy for that day. Don't be borrowing on tomorrow's mercies for today. But God gives you enough grace when you wake up for every single thing that's going to happen to you. And tomorrow when you wake up, he's going to give you enough grace for everything that's going to happen to you. And the next day, he's going to give you enough grace for that day for every single thing that's going to happen to you. And he knows and he sees and he cares and he's able and he's either going to rescue or he's going to redeem. But either way, you win. Either way, you win. I love this verse from 1 Peter. I'm just going to close with this. It's not on your screen. 
But would you just close your eyes and listen to this verse over your life? It's from 1 Peter chapter 5, and here's what it says. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares about you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist and firm in the faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering, you're not alone. The same kinds of suffering are being experienced by brothers and sisters all over the world. You're not alone. God is with you and in you. Other people are facing the marriage stuff or the dating stuff or the financial stuff or the physical stuff or the emotional stuff. You are not alone. Other brothers and sisters are facing it all around the world. And, and here's the promise of God. After you've suffered just a little while, the God of all grace, who's called you this eternal glory in Christ, he himself will restore you and confirm and strengthen and establish you. To him be glory forever. Listen, maybe you're in the middle of a situation right now and it terrifies you. You don't know what's going to happen. It's an immediate thing. It's, it's real. It's legit. I'm not saying pretend like everything's okay. What I'm saying is God can get glory in the middle of your situation that should scare the pants off of anybody. But when you say, what do I have to fear? God is with me and in me. The world sits up and takes notice and says, how are they so calm? How do they have peace? I mean, I have peace when there's great stuff in my bank account. I have peace when my body's good. I have peace when my marriage is good. I have peace when my kids are good. How do they have peace no matter what they're walking through? It's like they have reason to fear and they're not afraid. Explain that to me. Do you know that would be the biggest witness to the lost world on the planet? It's because we have a God who's with us and we have a God who's in us. What do we have to be afraid of? We have a God who parts the Red Sea. We have a God who makes manna show up on the ground. We have a God who leads us in military victory when we don't even know how to fight. We have a God who's given us a promise and a hope and a future. So in the face of things that should be scary, I choose courage because he's with me and he's in me. What would life be like for you if that was your choice? There's some in this house that it's not an immediate threat. It's about all the what ifs. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? And, and the enemy has whispered this like, does God even know? Does God even see? Does God even care? Is God even able to rescue? And, and Jesus says, are you serious? You, you, you're not that powerful. You can't control your life to make it great. You can't control your way into making your kids' lives great. You're not that powerful, my friend. In the middle of this, he says, I do know and I do see and, and the things that are threats out there that are not immediate. You can trust me because I'm not just your God who's with you. I'm your father. And I delight in giving good gifts to my kids. Every single thing you face, I will either rescue you or I will redeem it and work it out for your good. I'll turn every tragedy into triumph. And so no matter what you're scared of, you could face, I'm your dad. You don't have to be anxious. Just cast that on me. I care about you. I'm either going to rescue you out of it or I'm going to redeem it. So either way you win, what do you have to be anxious about? What would happen if every time the enemy whispered those lies to you, you said, in a spirit of anxiety, you leave me in the name of Jesus. Because my God says he will work all things, not just something, he'll work all things out for my good and his glory, for the call, for those he loves, called according to his purpose. You can be free from this. You can be free from fear and from worry and anxiety about the immediate threats and those that are all out there that are not immediate. Would you just break that lie right now? If that's you, would you just confess that to Jesus? The Bible says that we should confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just confess it to Jesus right now. 
Say, God, forgive me for giving into fear. God, forgive me for giving into worry. Church, I just want to leave you with this last thought. Battling fear and worry and anxiety has so much to do, more to do with your thoughts about God than your thoughts about your circumstances. If you're battling fear and worry and anxiety, it, it, it's a battle to think rightly about God, not to think rightly about your circumstances. Do you see that He's with you and in you? Do you see that He's your Father you can trust? He's always going to rescue or redeem. Break that lie from the enemy right now. Just say, in the name of Jesus, I break those lies from the enemy. I am not alone. My God is with me and in me. God does see. God does know. God does care. He is able, and he will rescue or redeem. Say that right now. And let's walk in victory. Father, I pray that you would help us be people who are strong and courageous in the face of things that would scare anyone else. We could say, we have a God who's with us and in us. That we would not be people of this world who would be anxious about what might be or what might happen or what could happen or what should happen. But in the middle of uncertainty, we would trust that you are our Father who knows and loves and sees and is able. And you will always rescue or you will always redeem. In either way, we win. Set us free in Jesus' name.